Hello, this is Rachel Babin from Oncology News Australia, proud producers of the Oncology Journal Club. This week, we have the first of two special episodes dedicated to the recent World Conference on Lung Cancer. We have incredible analysis and some very unique interviews that I promise you won't hear anywhere else. We open this first episode with the marvellous musical stylings of Mayhem Tom, international rock star by night, who also happens to moonlight as a medical oncologist by day. Welcome Tom John, who chats with Craig Underhill about destiny. We also have the wonderful Bishra Gayawali talking us through what he doesn't adore about Adora. Nick Pavlakis chats about the newly formed Toga Group. And we wrap up with an update from Christian Rolfo on CTDNA. In part two, you'll hear from Tim Clay, Ben Solomon, Anna Nowak and Gilberto Lopez. So look out for episode 26. We hope you enjoy today's entertaining and informative episode. As ever, the links to all of the papers discussed today are available in the notes. For the latest oncology news and podcast updates, subscribe to the Oncology Newsletter for free on oncologynews.com.au. This is Rachel Babin, and this is the Oncology Podcast. G'day, g'day, g'day. It's a time for another great Oncology Journal Club podcast special. We weren't going to have one on World Lung, but there was so much data and we've been able to get so many fantastic people to comment on papers. We think you'll really enjoy it. So sit back and listen to Craig, Hans and me interview a wide variety of experts from around the world on all the latest updates from World Lung. Hey, Craig. Hey, Eva. Hey, uh, there's a really cool muso. I don't know. Have you ever heard of him? His name's Mayhem Tom. I have. The great single that he's got out at the moment. Yeah, he's fantastic. I hear he moonlights in lung cancer too. (laughs) So who is he, Eva? Well, why don't you introduce him? Because I understand you're going to grill him about world lung. I am. So it's an absolute pleasure to introduce Mayhem Tom, aka Tom John, Associate Professor Tom John from the Peter McCallum Cancer Centre in Melbourne, an international expert in lung cancer, and it's a great pleasure to have him on the show today. Just rolled his eyes, Tom, you're international, mate. It's a great pleasure to have him on this special podcast. Welcome, Tom. Oh, thank you so much, Craig and Eva, for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here, and thanks for the free plug for my uh, alter ego, Mayhem Tom. <laughs> we want to hear from him a little later, but first. <laughs> yes, but first, let's talk lung cancer, indeed. Yeah, so we've got two papers to cover. The first one, Tom, is a pretty important one, Keynote 598, dual PD-1 and CTLA-4 checkpoint blockade, which confers no therapeutic benefit beyond PD-1 blockade alone in pd one positive non-small cell lung cancer. So do you want to just outline this study briefly, Tom, and we'll talk a little bit about the context of it. Yeah, indeed. So this was a study presented by our very own Michael Boyer, from Sydney. The study used a combination of ipilimumab at a dose of one milligram per kilogram every six weeks with pembrolizumab or pembrolizumab plus placebo. All patients needed to be pd one greater than 50%, EGFR ALK wild type. So the standard sort of population for these immunotherapy trials and sort of equivalent to many of the other IO studies using pembrolizumab. The primary endpoint was overall survival, Guess of note, um, you know, three quarters of the patients were non-squamous, a quarter was squamous, which is sort of what you'd expect. And as you've outlined, there was no difference in overall survival, which, as I said, was the primary endpoint. The objective response rate, very similar to what we've seen in Keynote 024, which was pembrolizumab compared to chemotherapy. So that response rate was 45%. But I think of note, and this is probably the more important part of the study, is the adverse event list because there's quite a high rate of discontinuation in the ipilimumab arm. 
And this is a group of patients who are high PDL1 and, you know, the type of person that you want to give as much immunotherapy to as possible. So the discontinuation rate was twice that of the Pembro alone arm, so about 15% of patients. Most of the AEs were rash, pneumonitis, ALT, derangement and colitis. So, you know, all of the things that you'd sort of expect from the addition of vipulimumab. And I, I guess it confirms that in this subset of patients, adding the CTLA-4 inhibitor didn't make any difference. So, Tom, in this patient population of enriched patients, more than 50% beta-1 positive, what's your standard now? So this was a comparison of Epinevo versus Pembro. So are you using single-agent Pembro in that group or are you adding in chemo? Yeah, it's a very good question. We currently have a trial open at the moment in this subset, which adds another monoclonal antibody called tirogolumab to atezolizumab. So that's sort of our go-to at the moment. We do add chemotherapy to patients where a response is needed. But actually, if you look at some of the landmark analyses from these studies, even though response rate is improved, it doesn't seem like survival is much different with the addition of chemotherapy so far, but we'll wait and see what the longer term data shows. Yeah, we'll come back in a sec to the survival, but just in this Mm. off study, what you would think the standard is now. So we tend to, in our small centre, we tend to use single-agent Pembro or, as you say, we're worried someone's got quite bulky disease and maybe getting on to performance score two and they really don't have much time, you probably would add in some chemo four cycles of chemo yeah because of the time it takes for the single agent pembro to work so that's sort of what we do but as you say our first preference is trials and there's still more trials need to be done or we need to wait for results of completed trials really to tease this out a bit more i think yeah yes indeed there are actually quite a few trials on the horizon so not just the skyscraper studies there's other pembrolizumab um, studies there's a study called leap There's a few on the horizon. I'm not sure what else is open in in Melbourne at the moment or in Australia, but certainly there are a couple of other trials looking to improve on single-agent immunotherapy in this context. And I just wanted to note for a second that overall survival for both these arms was 21 months. So it's just incredible, really, that we're seeing that kind of length of survival, whereas, you know, five years ago we were seeing 12 months was a good result in a phase three study. So things are really moved along. It's really exciting times for lung cancer, Yeah, which segues into the next paper, which is a new molecule. Now, we always very particular how we say things on the Oncology Journal podcast. So this was a paper with trastuzumab deruxtecan. I think that's right, a potential new treatment option for the HER2 positive non-small cell lung cancer. This is quite an exciting molecule. Yeah, it is, absolutely. There's actually two abstracts on this that were presented at World Lung. So there's two cohorts you'll see as part of the study. There's a cohort that are HER2 overexpressing, and that was presented by Dr. Nakagawa, and there was another cohort that are HER2 mutant. And while there's some overlap in those two, HER2 mutations don't always result in HER2 overexpression and vice versa. So They're separate cohorts and the results are actually quite different of note. So if I take you through the first study, that's the study that was in cohort one or HER2 overexpressing tumours. So the inclusion was based on immunohistochemistry. So HER2 immunohistochemistry 2 plus versus 3 plus versus 1 plus. Most of the patients were 2 plus, 80%, and 20% were HER2 3 plus. So they reported in that study, so for cohort one, so again, the primary endpoint here is objective response rate and progression-free survival is a secondary endpoint. And of note, this is a really heavily pretreated study. So these patients, the median number of treatments was three. So most people have had chemo and IO before getting onto this study. Their objective response rate was 20% in the three plus and 25% in the two plus. So Reasonable responses in a heavily pretreated population. The disease control rates, there's a lot more stability, it was 70%. And the duration of response seems to be around six months. So this certainly shows that there's activity in this 
subset of patients. But the concern in this subset of patients were the treatment-related AEs. So they had eight cases of interstitial lung disease out of 49 patients, and three of them were grade five. So while they feel that two of those three were actually disease progression, it is still a serious AE. And again, it is a heavily pretreated population. So you do have to you know, think about there are quite a few nuances with this group of patients. So I think this is still very encouraging and also still a very um, selected biomarker selected cohort. So, and the fact that the responses and duration are in two plus and three plus and the the higher the expression didn't seem to make any difference, it does potentially offer another therapeutic in that group of patients. The next cohort was part two, and that was presented by Egbert Smith. And this, I think, is a little bit more interesting because it's a group of patients now that have HER2 mutations. And now we see the objective response rate in this cohort of patients is 62%. So that's behaving a little bit more like what you expect from an oncogene-driven tumor, whereas the IHC, that 20 30%, and you're probably picking out some of those tumors that are oncogene driven and the remainder aren't. Again, the duration of response is quite good in this study. It was 7.8 months. And the toxicity didn't seem to be as high as in the first cohort. You know, obviously ILD is still a, uh, a nasty toxicity, but they didn't have any grade five events in this study. Interesting data, isn't it? So I guess we'll learn to use the drug better often with new molecules when they come out, we're not quite sure how to manage the toxicity or select the patient. So hopefully that issue about interstitial lung disease we'll learn about and manage. But there's an interest, of course, in this drug and this class in other tumours. Eva wants to ask a question. More just a comment that we are seeing the same interstitial lung disease in the breast cancer trials, the colorectal and upper GI trials with this agent. So it is a class effect and we need to understand it more and be cautious. But this drug is really impacting across the spectrum, I think. And like trastuzumab in breast cancer, Eva, are we seeing cardiac toxicity with this drug? Which is, a we forgot to mention, it's an anti HER2 antibody with a topo isomerase 1 inhibitor payload. So Yes. Do we see cardiac issues? Interestingly, we don't. That's not a reported toxicity of this agent. I don't know if you're seeing it in the GI setting either. Not really. So I think the key to this is the payload doing the damage and giving the effect, and the HER2 agent is really just the tumour targeting mechanism. Yeah, and I guess there's a thing with the amount of time people are on this drug. Obviously, you know that toxicity is probably more cumulative and the median sort of duration of response, you know, it's probably not like using um, Herceptin in breast cancer, but we're still early days with this molecule. So, Tom, I was going to get you to talk about Adura, but there's actually not a lot to say, is there? We have disease-free survival, Vantage, no overall survival yet, and the PROMS showed quality of life was maintained. What else is there to say? Would you like to tell us about it, though? No, Adora, it's so boring. I don't want to hear any more talk about it. Look, it's probably best summarised by this song. I have climbed highest mountain. I have run through the field only to be with you. Only to be with you, but I still haven't found what I'm looking for. But I still haven't found what I'm looking for. Adora, we adore you, but you're doing our head. DFS is great, but oh, it's just not yet. Two guys, you team, not for the first time. Gefeet and the lot, and even now, I'll see this time. Adora means encouragement, encouraging it is, but ready for fun time? Might be a thing. Mayhem Tom at music, you're a whiz. Even though Tom John, my cancer is your biz. Yeah. But I still haven't found what I'm looking for. 
looking for. No, I still, I still haven't found. I still haven't found what I'm looking for. Oh my god, I'm Ooh. in love with my hands. <laughs> Ah, thanks. Now that worked really well. Well, we have a very special guest to really give us the ultimate opinion on Adora and a few other world lung issues. It's Bishal Gawali from Kingston, Ontario. Now, Bish is an avid tweeter, and my favourite of his recent tweets was, why does Bing search even exist? (laughs) I think that shows a profound understanding of the questions the Twitter sphere can help with. And he also recently tweeted out his live CV, which is a great idea. Have a look at it on his Twitter feed. So he's both a practising oncologist, but particularly now well-known for research in three domains, cancer policy and trial methodology, global oncology, and clinical cancer research. So my first question to you, Bish, is do you own or have ever listened to any recordings from Mayhem Tom? (laughs) I'll have to say no. Sorry. (laughs) Okay. Well, we'll come back to that. But today's interview in this post-World Lung Cancer Conference podcast is about your recent viewpoint, published February 4 in JAMA Oncology, with the wonderful title, Why Not Adore Adora? The Trial We Need Versus The Trial We Got. So was this a solicited review, Bish? Yeah, this was a solicited debate article with the point and counterpoint pro and con side of the debate. Jack West and I did the cautionary approach to Adora, and Nate Panel has done the Adora is already practice changing part of the viewpoint. And actually, even before this, we had published a commentary, which was not invited, a peer-reviewed commentary at Journal of Clinical Oncology about Adora itself. And JCO allows 2,000 words, so you have more flexibility to say more things there. And in that paper, we make an argument using Adora as an example, but we go beyond Adora and we discuss how we need to think about adjuvant cancer drug trials in general. And we actually propose the philosophy of three E's, evidence, ethics, and economics, how we should factor all these three E's together in thinking about adjuvant cancer drug trials. And in this JAMA Oncology article that was more recently published, it was more of a debate, a specific in regards to Adora, whether it is already practice changing or not. Nathan Pennell, he takes a viewpoint that it is already practice changing and patients should start receiving it immediately, whereas Zach West and I, we take a viewpoint that, uh, yes, the DFS benefits do look impressive, but we should wait for more mature data. That is overall survival, which is ultimately the point of an adjuvant study, correct? Yes, because unlike... uh, you know, metastatic setting where you can actually measure treatment response. You have a disease burden that you can follow up with treatment and you can say, yes, the treatment is working. No, the treatment is not working. In adjuvant setting, the necessarily the treatment is blind. There is no disease to follow. There is no disease to capture whether the treatment is working or not and to tailor the treatment midway. So you need to wait until the event happens sometimes in the future. So in that case, the other side of the equation is that in adjuvant setting, we are necessarily over-treating patients because not all of them will relapse. So we are treating all the patients, some of whom may never need any therapy, with the hope that some of them will not have the disease come back. So to make that judgment, I think we need to have overall survival data. We need to be confident to tell patients that, yes, you have a higher chances of living longer by doing this. And it's not like a couple of cycles of chemotherapy we're talking about here, right? It's about three years of adjuvant treatment, oral therapy every day for three years which is a significant therapeutic burden. So maybe CTDNA will help us work out more how to target our adjuvant 
therapies and Hans is actually mm-hmm. hosting an upcoming episode of the Oncology Journal podcast on CTDNA. Do they have any biospecimens suitable to analyze this in Adora, to your knowledge? To my knowledge, there is no information on tailoring the response to treatment based on changes in CTDNA. But uh, that is definitely something that has prospect to change how we approach adjuvant therapy in the future. There is more promise in, in colorectal cancer, for example. But yeah, in case of lung cancer, that is still an area of investigation. So what has been the reaction to your series of articles? Yeah, it has been interesting because, you know, I have received many emails and feedback from colleagues all over the world. And it is very interesting to wake up in the morning and see your inbox filled with a number of emails from people that you have never known. You don't even know the name, but, and these are busy clinicians who are writing to thank for a critical approach towards the trial and thanking us for doing the critical evaluation that they would have otherwise missed. Because whenever you see any positive trial being presented at like ASCO meeting, this was an ASCO plenary at first, right? So whenever you see any big positive trial in New England Journal or at these big meetings, the first instinctive reaction of every oncologist is to say, wow, what a wonderful result. This is a great day for patients. Congratulations to everyone. But it takes actually time and critical thinking to go through that and to shield yourself against all those hype and to take a neutral critical view and to have the courage to speak your mind out because not everyone will be quite receptive to a viewpoint. But the good thing is to realize that there are several oncologists out there, and not all of them are on Twitter, not all of those voices we hear about every day, but there are several oncologists out there who appreciate someone taking a critical view of the data and who appreciate learning those viewpoints and tailoring their clinical decisions based on those viewpoints. I think, Eva, we should invite him more on this podcast because actually that's one of the goals of our podcast is to look at critically at the papers that are published in the literature. And of course, Bish, you've got the Canadian perspective, non-American perspective, which again is quite different because of your different health system. Mm-hmm. Yeah, actually, I have had the opportunity to work in different healthcare systems throughout my training and career. I did my medical school in Nepal. I'm originally from Nepal, so which is a low-income country, and that's where my interest in global oncology comes from. I did my postgraduate training in Japan, which is a high-income country in Asia, but The system is completely different from what we see in North America. And I did a year of cancer policy fellowship at Harvard before moving to Canada. So I have had this opportunity to get some test of different healthcare systems. But yeah, currently looking at the Canadian healthcare system, it is definitely very different from the U.S. healthcare system where all that matters is a p-value of less than 0.05. It does not even matter the, how much magnitude of clinical benefit is expected from the drug, whether the surrogate endpoint is validated or not validated, or what the cost of the drug is versus the Canadian system where all those issues are factored in making decisions. So, But I guess we are talking about global oncology as well. One important thing about US FDA decision is that the implications of those decisions are not only inside the US. It has global implications. Like practicing in Nepal, India, people will talk about, oh, this is an FDA-approved drug. So this should be a good drug for the patient. This is FDA-approved, so we have to start using it. And we are talking about patients who will be paying for these medications from their pocket in these parts of the world. So that's why I'm very interested in the US FDA drug approval process, and I have published a number of papers about that, because not only about what happens in the U.S., but what the global ramifications are about the decisions that happen in the U.S. FDA. So that leads nicely to your question, Hans. Yeah, indeed. So I wanted to know, because you it is also in the field of disparity, did you see any interesting publications or presentations on the World Long Conference about disparity? To be honest, I didn't come across any important disparity research, but I did attend a couple of talks about cancer disparity and how those inequalities are translating into difference in outcomes for patients. 
and my philosophy has always been that, you know, I'm an advocate of the philosophy of cancer ground set. I have written about cancer ground set uh, and I published this in Lancet Oncology in 2018. We always talk about cancer moon sets and, and about getting new treatments out faster for the patients. And that is quite important. I'm not discounting that. But the fact remains that for majority of the patients, their outcomes after being diagnosed with lung cancer or any other cancer for that matter, still depends on where they live rather than what their disease biology is. For lung cancer, if you look at lung cancer, your five-year survival will depend more on the level of insurance that you have or the quality of health insurance you have or where you live in the world rather than whether or not you have EGFR positivity. So that's quite sad. And so I think globally, we need to focus more on how we can make the interventions that we already know to work accessible to every cancer patient in the world. And this is what I call as cancer ground set. We need to have a cancer ground set program running parallel to cancer moon set so that, you know, developing new medications is important. But if nobody can afford it, if the medication does not reach anyone, then there is no point in having it. I used to call that for patients in Nepal, discovery of osimertinib is like the discovery of a black hole. It sounds exciting from scientific point of view, but practically meaningless because my patients are never going to have access to these drugs for the next five years at least. So, Bishim, you might not be a politician because I don't think ground shot sounds as cool <laughs> as moonshot, but we totally agree here. I'm just going to ask you to conclude, do you agree with Mayhem Tom that we still haven't found what we're looking for with Adora? <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. I completely agree with that. Would you like to sing it? Would you like to sing for us? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. Uh, I think uh, I guess that's uh, no huh yeah I think your audience will never come back to your podcast if uh, they, they listen to me <laughs> singing uh, but maybe you didn't hear but we sang Baby Shark before eh? so that was a big hit on our podcast <laughs> eh? oh, yeah. yeah my daughter absolutely loves it <laughs> So thank you very much. We look forward to interacting with you in the future because you're a big influencer and your messages are important to get out. Thank you so much, Bish, for coming on OJC Podcast. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. It has been my honor. Thank you. It's a great pleasure to welcome back to the podcast Professor Nick Pavlakis from Royal North Shore Hospital in Sydney, who is a medical oncologist who specialises particularly in GI and lung cancer. So today we've got him on to talk a little bit about lung cancer and the new cooperative group called TOGA. So welcome back, Nick. Thanks for coming along. Thanks, Craig. Hi. So tell us a little bit about this, the, it's the newest cooperative group in Australasia, which is TOGA. Yeah, so TOGA is the Thoracic Oncology Group of Australasia. It was formed in July last year, arising out of the historical Australasian Lung Cancer Trials Group. Members from that group formed TOGA. And the reason it was formed was to have a completely focused group on thoracic cancer research in Australia from the perspective of, I guess, independence and, and running research in lung cancer and thoracic cancers and have the ability to fundraise and prov apply for grants exclusively just for the purpose of lung cancer or mesothelioma or other thoracic cancers. Yeah, great. So it's a multidisciplinary group. It's not We've got a multidisciplinary audience, so it's not just medical oncologists. Presumably there's various disciplines. That's absolutely, and we, we actually are seeking membership expansion Thoracic physicians, thoracic surgeons, allied health, nursing researchers, a translationalist and laboratory. The philosophy is to have representation across the breadth of clinical medicine and translational medicine in the way similarly that other groups do, like AGITG. Craig, and you and I have been a part of that. Yep. And basically offer opportunities to, I guess, in, in our own clinical trials to help other groups address questions that are difficult to address in other settings and to provide clinically meaningful research questions uh, in our trials. 
is there some nurse going to be some nursing led trials as well? Do you think down the track, Nick? I would hope that we could have some nursing led trials. Absolutely, we've had a always had a, a strong psychologic supportive care overarching group. Now they're a, they're a distinct group within this, but they'll be invited to look at every protocol and see if we can add value from a nursing point of view. What we can offer in Toga is also through our engagement with the clinical trial centre is, I guess, the structure and platform to develop a trial protocol. I think that with nursing, that opportunity may not have existed in the past, and we'd like to encourage our nurse participants in the group to feel willing and able to seek a concept, and we'll do our efforts to see if we can get it to fruition to full protocol. Fantastic. So tell us about some of the protocols that are opening because I had a look on the website the other day and there was quite some quite exciting concepts amongst those initial trials. So currently the TOGA investigators are involved in a number of styles. There's a, a legacy and a history through our involvement with ALTG and we'll have some dual badge studies. But as we move forward, our leading trial concept at the moment is the Aspiration Trial, which is a national multi-center observational cohort study of a 1,000 patients to evaluate upfront comprehensive genomic profiling using NGS on newly diagnosed patients with lung cancer. And you and I had an offline discussion earlier, Craig, about how we can make sure that this trial is accessible to patients across the whole of Australia, not just in the specialised centres. If we can demonstrate and collect the data that we can provide meaningful information on the use of targeted therapies and demonstrate that it's worth the cost, then this study provides a platform to change practice in four or five years' time and have government fund it. Yeah, absolutely. So I noticed too that there's a focus on education with this group as well. And you've already recorded quite a number of podcasts and hosted a number of events. Yeah, thanks, Craig. And it's interesting, probably one good, pos- one strong positive thing that's come out of the COVID situation is is the use of podcasts in a way that we can interact with each other and, I guess, provide that banter around the science that we miss from attending the meetings face-to-face. And so our lead in the board for our education arm is Melissa Moore from St. Vincent's Hospital in Melbourne. And she's done a wonderful job in getting the group together with assistance from others. We've always run a preceptorship, which is a bit different to how the other preceptorships are run. And and also we want to look at some workshops to help people understand clinical trial methodology working with the CTC uh, on that. Yeah, that's great. And it's not expensive to join compared to some other groups. So I noticed there's free training membership, there's free community membership, and the full membership is not expensive. So I think anyone listening who has of interest in uh, lung cancer, I would jump on the TOGA website, thoraciconcology.org.au. Uh, we'll, we'll, cl- we'll put a link on the podcast information for this episode, and I'd urge people to have a look and join, be part of it. Thanks, Craig. So thanks again, Nick. It's an exciting time in lung cancer. You know, when we look back to uh, where it was even a decade ago or five years ago, it's changed enormously and it's through clinical trials and new treatments, the translation of the understanding of the oncogenes into practice. It's a really exciting time and I think there's a lot more excitement to come in lung cancer in the next few years. They can't see you nodding, Nick. You need to say something. uh, Yes, indeed. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, uh, you're so so true with those comments craig absolutely we've gone from a desert to an oasis and hopefully the sort of learnings from lung cancer can wash off in some of the other tumor types and that you and i treat that begging for a breakthrough yeah absolutely i mean there's much more rational approach now in lung cancer more than any other cancer i would think i mean that's you know it's the realisation that it's lungs are site of origin, but they're really all different cancers. Yeah, that sort of learning of, I guess, focusing on the biology. It's not one disease anymore. Lung cancer is just a mixture of less common and and rare disease subtypes. And if you're a patient with lung cancer, of course, you'll hope that 
you won't be pigeonholed like we used to with a sort of broad-based empiric therapy, although we know chemoimmunotherapy is quite fantastic for some patients. But if you can identify your target and be more specific, you'll get a better outcome with the therapies. Yeah, so there's still a lot more to do, and it's through the, really the trial process that we're going to work it all out. It's pretty complicated. So, yeah, it's a good opportune time for everyone to get involved, and we need to, as we talked about, we need to ensure that we can make the trials accessible to as many sites and many patients as we can. And I think COVID's taught us to be comfortable with telehealth and I think teletrials, which is really using telehealth to run a trial, is going to be the glue to bring the system together and really enable much better recruitment across the country, hopefully in the years ahead. Absolutely, Craig, and and people like yourself and others who've been, had the most experience with that could teach some of us in the cities how to do it better. Yeah, and I think there's much. I think there's much more willingness now for people to consider it because I think the imperative of COVID and using telehealth has taught people that it's okay. In it's not in all circumstances, but in most circumstances, you know, it's a safe way of practicing medicine and you know, getting the balance between access and there's a balance isn't there between the face-to-face and telehealth and so you have to take into consideration the circumstances and patient choice and clinician choice but usually you can make telehealth work and it's the same running a trial too there's certain circumstances where we can monitor remotely or supervise sites via regular phone calls or video calls do do remote consultations with patients so that and it makes it easier for them to be able to access the trial. And most definitely, I mean, you improve equity of access and also ultimately the generalizability of the results because you've actually sampled a broader population. Yep, that's right. Fantastic, Nick. Thanks for coming on the show again. And um, everyone, jump onto Toga website and sign up and uh, be part of this very exciting time in lung cancer. Thanks, Nick. Thanks, Craig. I'm very pleased to interview Professor Christian Rolfo. He's a medical oncologist and also a good friend of mine. He's the director of the Jurassic Medical Oncology and the Early Clinical Trials at the University of Maryland in Baltimore in the U.S. And he's actually specialized in Jurassic Oncology, drug development, translation oncology, etc. So, Christian, welcome here on the podcast. You're here to comment a bit on, you're specialized a bit also in liquid biopsies. That's the least I can say. So in this World Lung Conference, what did you pick up as, let's say, highlights in that field or how liquid biopsies could play a role in different trials? Yeah. First of all, thank you for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. And uh, yeah, certainly in liquid biopsies, in all the events that we have right now, ACR, ESMO, certainly and also in World Lung Cancer. We have some data coming from the BFAST study. This is a study that is taking in consideration the liquid biopsy or the free DNA testing using foundation as a unique source for detect some mutations. So in this different cohort that this trial have, we knew from some former Congress the AL cohort in Alectinib. And there are also other cohorts like ROS1 and BRAF and, and also CMB as well. But in this Congress, we knew about the uh, red fusion. The problem here, and this is very interesting because the opportunity to detect these alterations in blood is fascinating and also not only for the detection, but for the monitoring of these mutations or alterations. But in the case of this study, I think the problem was that the selection of the target was good, but the selection of the drug was not correct because at the moment of the design, they were using alectinib that we know that alectinib is an AL translocation inhibitor, but also a red fusion inhibitor. But with the new landscape that we have with new red inhibitors like uh, paralcetinib, selpercatinib, was a little bit outdated. The company that was the sponsor of that and the PI decided to close prematurely this trial because in the number of patients that they recruit, there was six patients, was very limited activity. As I say, with selpercatinib and pralcetinib, alectinib had not really a role in this specific alteration. So that was a pity example, but at least this study I think is very interesting. We'll give a lot of ideas what has happened with the liquid biopsy first. 
The results of the AL cohort was very positive, were presented by Gargel in ESMO last year. And we are waiting certainly the BMT that will be very interesting because it's a prospective study and we hope to have the results soon because the enrollment was completed. In terms of other analysis of liquid biopsies in this Congress, we have the ARIA study, that is the activity of next generation ALK-TIK AI based on ALK resistant mutations detected by liquid biopsy in ALK positive patients pretreated. This was an uh, interesting study, it was an effort of different centers across the world. And in this study, they were able to identify using as a second or third line regatinib or uh, lorlatinib, they were able to identify mechanisms of resistance, that that is the meaning also of liquid biopsy, and see a little bit the outcomes, showing a little bit poor outcomes in patients with brigatinib in some of the patients that were heavily pretreated in the case of brigatinib. Uh, so I think this is a very interesting study that make an example what we are having right now for detect these mutations. And uh, another study that I would like to highlight here was, a, there were several studies, different studies from China. There is another from Poland. There is another from Latvia. They are using EGFR mutations or other alterations following these patients with uh, buff. So see the dynamics of the allelic fraction variation to determine if these patients will be able to get a better outcomes. There is another study that is really interesting. It's a Chinese study that they were using the dynamic in patients who were actually resected with mutations. So patients that are stage four or three, that they have some alterations. And after a response of the target therapy, they want to resect the primary Tumor. So this is a kind of concept that sometimes we are debating in some of the patients that they have a spectacular response and they have a minimal residual disease. And you cannot go further even if the patient is continuing the treatment. This is the maximum sometimes that you can get. So in this population, they include a number of patients from this stage 3, stage 4 for 37 patients and dynamically monitoring within one week before and after surgery. So that was 20 patients. Majority of the patients coming from China obviously were EGFR mutated positive, and they were receiving, at the moment of the analysis, they were not able to have, I think, osimertinib. So you have here erlotinib or gefitinib, and a couple of patients with alt translocation that they were receiving crisotinib. They demonstrate that the dynamic of the blood in the mutated gene they call it abundance, that is the, the peak of you have after or the resectability is a poor prognosis for these patients. So I think this is giving also the idea of what liquid biopsy is able to do in terms of prognostic factor for lung cancer. No? I can say that were the most important things that I saw in liquid biopsy. Thank you very much for this uh, clear overview. And I can already tell you that we will soon have a specific podcast all on liquid biopsies and that we will invite you again to discuss a bit more on the specific advantages, disadvantages within thoracic oncology. Thank you, Christian, for this nice interview. Thank you. Thank you very much. So thanks to all our special guests and, of course, to Craig and Hans, Rachel, our producer. Hope you've enjoyed this Oncology Journal Club podcast, World Lung Update, super special. Bye for now. And don't forget, part two, out soon. You've been listening to the Oncology Podcast. If you enjoyed today's edition and would like to subscribe, head over to our website, oncologynews.com.au and sign up to our newsletter. Thanks for listening.